This morning, uh, we continue our study in the life of Solomon, and I, I don't know about you, but I found this study to be fascinating on the one hand. On the other hand, it's kind of hard to preach sometimes. You know, you get these uh, descriptions, in, uh, especially in First Kings, of these long building projects with supplies, and I'm taking that and going, okay, how am I supposed to make a sermon out of that, right? But at the same time, we've discovered that Solomon's story is often our story. And as I've read each week and prepared each week, and by the way, we have uh, three more weeks in Solomon, and then we'll close this story down, and, and we're heading into some new stuff uh, for the fall, um, or for the later part of the fall. But in this story, uh, I'm reminded that God's Word is God's Word, right? And even in these Old Testament passages where you read it and say, well, that's a nice history story, but I don't know about application, we find that God's Word is active. And the author of Hebrews tells us, That God's word is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. God's word is applicable to our lives today. This morning we're going to continue to study the story of Solomon and continue to find as we look at this story, again, it's interesting stuff. I mean, this is stuff that you could you know, have a History Channel documentary about, but at the same time, it is God's Word to us, and so we should read it with uh, the, the awareness that it has something to do with our own lives. This morning, we're going to be in 1 Kings chapter 9. I would invite you to find a Bible. If you don't have one with you, you should be able to find one in the pew in front of you. And open to 1 Kings chapter 9 this morning. We're going to kind of take the tail end of that chapter, and then we're going to pick up in chapter 10 this morning. This is an overview of Solomon's wealth and prosperity. But before we dive into the text, I want to just kind of recap where we've been. If you've not been with us, we've been studying this uh, story since the last week in May. And you might remember in the very first week of that study, we found David as an old man. And again, he was uh, not able to do a whole lot. He's in bed, and all of a sudden, Adonijah, his oldest son, who you might say had a a right to the throne, steps up and tries to make himself king. David, again, long story here, but in short, he he initiates or anoints Solomon as king. And some scholars believe that Solomon was very young when he took the throne, maybe even as young as 12 years old. And so Solomon is king, and God comes to him and says to him, you can have whatever you want. Now, wouldn't you like that? Wouldn't that be cool? And what does Solomon ask for? He asks for a discerning heart, and and you remember he says in the text, I am a little child. I don't know how to rule this great people of yours. God, would you give me wisdom? Would you give me a discerning heart? And of all the things that Solomon did wrong, this is one thing that he did right. He asked God for the right thing. And God God gives him this, but God also gives him uh, wealth and prosperity as a result of that. In August, we talked about the temple. We won't rehash all that, but we walked through that together, this building of this centralized place of worship. Solomon, you remember, is building this palace also. Again, we are seeing, though, cracks in Solomon's armor as we're moving along here. Lots of good things are happening, but we get a sense that the story is heading downhill. Last week we came to 1 Kings chapter 9. We took this entire chapter here. And in this chapter, we started to sense a dark cloud over Solomon. You remember that? We saw he was he was using slave labor, right, to to build all of his projects. His wives are growing and they're pagan and he's building palaces for them. And so we got this this kind of less idealistic view of Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 9. Well this morning We're going to pick up at the very end of that. We're going to pick up in in chapter 9, verse 26 and following. Then we're going to go over into chapter 10 uh, with the story of the Queen of Sheba, which is uh, a very, very interesting story. So this morning, 1 Kings chapter 9, uh, verses 26 through 28, we begin with Solomon's ships. King Solomon also built ships at Ezon Geber, which is near Eloth in Edom on the shore of the Red Sea. Now, I'll put a map up for you here so you can kind of see what we're talking about here. But uh, this this region is down near Egypt, in that peninsula there. And he's building ships down there. Now, we know Solomon has an alliance with Egypt, right? Because he's married to who? Pharaoh's daughter. You've been paying attention, right? So he's married to Pharaoh's daughter. And we know that he's building ships in this region down there. 
And again, Solomon is trying to expand his trade routes. Again, this is what people did in that day and time. We read in verse 27, Hiram sent men. Now, who's Hiram? You remember this guy, don't you? He's the guy who gave him all the wood for the temple, all the supplies for the temple. Solomon's had a 20-year relationship with this guy, Hiram. And Hiram's still involved here in Solomon's, uh, uh, Solomon's life. Hiram sent men, sailors who knew the sea. Now, Hiram is from where? He's from Tyre on the Mediterranean Sea. He would have had people who understood the sea. And he sends them down to help Solomon's men, to serve in a fleet with Solomon's men. They sailed to Ophir and brought back 420 talents of gold, which they delivered to the king Solomon. Now Hiram's an ally. He sends his navy down to help Solomon's men. And where do they go? I'll put up another map here. The second arrow toward the bottom there is this place called Ophir. So they're building ships at the north part of the Red Sea, they're sailing down, and they're bringing back lots of gold. How much gold? Some scholars believe that a talent of gold is somewhere around 75 pounds, and if that is the case, they are bringing back 32,000 pounds of gold. Lots and lots of gold. And we talked last week about the fact that gold uh, begins to be this downward spiral for Solomon. The more gold that he gets, the further he, he, he veers from God. And so we got more gold coming into the story. Now we flip over to chapter 10. We find the story of the Queen of Sheba. Now before we read this story, it's, it's worth mentioning that this is one of the most widespread stories in all of ancient literature. The Bible is not the only account of this story. How many of you have heard of the Queen of Sheba before? Raise your hand if you have. Yeah, everybody's heard of it, right? Because there's stories in Islamic literature about the Queen of Sheba. There's stories in Coptic literature about the Queen of Sheba. There's stories in Ethiopian literature about the Queen of Sheba. And by the way, the Ethiopian account is the most detailed account. And they say a whole lot more than the Bible says about the Queen of Sheba. I'd encourage you... Go home, go on YouTube, and Google Queen of Sheba, and there's documentaries there from the History Channel, from the Discovery Channel, and they'll tell you a lot more. And again, I'll just cover Scripture this morning, okay? I won't won't elaborate too much. But I will say that the Ethiopian account uh, details uh, this story and says that Solomon and the Queen of Sheba had a child, and they claim that this child... Is, is the beginning of a dynasty in Ethiopia that lasted all the way until 1974. So in 1974, the king of Ethiopia claimed uh, descendants from Solomon. But the Bible doesn't tell us any of that. Uh, we'll, we'll get into that just a little bit later. 1 Kings chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. When the queen of Sheba heard about all the fame of Solomon and his relationship to the Lord, she came to test Solomon with hard questions. Now, the Queen of Sheba is the first mention of her in the Bible. Who is she? Now, for some of us, it might seem a little strange to see a woman in charge in ancient times, right? We read often in Scripture, and especially in Israel, women are are kind of considered nobodies, right? Women don't have any power, any authority, but that's not the case in every ancient place. In fact, in both Assyrian and Egyptian uh, rulings, we see queens all the time. And scholars tell us that particularly in this place called Sheba, women were considered equals to men. They were equal in nearly all spheres of life. Civil, religious, military. uh, They were just, in many ways, women were just like men. And this could be because the queen was in charge, right? I mean, that would make sense. But you have the queen of Sheba who who is in charge, and she receives word somewhere about Solomon. We don't know how she finds out about Solomon. Now, The fact that we saw Solomon's ships very close to this region. I'll put up a third um, map for you this morning and look at this. If you look closely here, you see the top arrow. That's where they're building the ships. You see the bottom arrow. That's where they sail down to to get the gold. And just to the east of of the Red Sea there is this land called Sheba or Saba. And again, scholars, again, disagree about where Sheba is. Some people say that it's over in Ethiopia, present-day Ethiopia. Others say that it's in this land called Saba or Sheba. But very likely, I think, she heard about the stories from these men who were down on the ships about their king and all of the wealth and riches that he has. Look what it says in verse 2. She decides to make a trip to see him. Arriving at Jerusalem with a very great caravan, 
With camels carrying spices, large quantities of gold and precious stones, she came to Solomon and talked with him about all that she had on her mind. Now, this lady has resources, doesn't she? The place where she comes from is a rich region. Again, it, lots of spices in that region. Even in this present day, if you go there, you'll see lots of spices uh, being developed in that region. Also, uh, some scholars believe that the Queen of Sheba was responsible for kind of getting the spices out of that land to other places. She was the one, some believe, that established trade routes all over the place. And, and why did she want to visit Solomon? Some people will say that she was enamored by the stories of his wealth, and she wanted to go see if all this was true. Others say she was trying to establish trade routes up there in Israel, and so she makes the trip to establish trade routes. We're not really sure. But she does hear about him, and she is interested in seeing him. Again, the trip that she makes, if, now if, if Sheba is down there where we think that it is, it's about a 1,400-mile trip. Now, if you're riding a camel, camels do about 20 miles a day, that's a six-month trip on Camelback, okay? So she makes a huge investment to go see Solomon. She travels 1,400 miles. How is Solomon going to compare to the stories? Is he going to be impressive to her? Let's see what we read in verse 3. Solomon answered all her questions. Nothing was too hard for the king to explain to her. Now, He's a king, she is a queen. Maybe they're just, you know, she's asked, what would you do if this happened? And he tells her. Some believe that maybe she was posing riddles for him, you know, really hard riddles, and he was figuring, figuring them out. We're not sure exactly what the conversation was like, but she poses questions for him, and the Bible tells us he is answering every one of them. No matter how hard the situation, Solomon has the right answer. She's impressed, to say the least. Look at verse 4. When the queen of Sheba saw all the wisdom of Solomon, the palace he had built, the food on his table, the seating of his officials, the attending servants in their robes, his cupbearers, the burnt offerings he made at the temple of the Lord, she was overwhelmed. The translation NIV says overwhelmed. The ESV version, I like this translation. There was no more breath in her. <laughs> what would we say? We would say something like, he took her breath away. Exactly. That's what the word means. Look at what she says to him. She said to the king, The report I heard in my own country about your achievements and your wisdom is true. And then she admits, you know, I doubted. I didn't think that I would find it this way. And she says, But I did not believe these things until I came and saw with my own eyes. Indeed, not even half was told me. In wisdom and wealth, you have far exceeded the report I heard. In other words, Solomon was richer than she had heard. Solomon was wiser than she had heard. The words of the foreign queen, having made a six-month, 1,400-mile trip to confirm this, look at what she says, verse 8. How happy your people must be. How happy your officials who continually stand before you and hear your wisdom. Now, interestingly enough, the new revised standard version translates this verse this way. Happy are your wives. Happy are these your servants who continually attend you and hear your wisdom. Now, again, some have read into this a little bit. and They said, you know, she goes, happy are your wives. In other words, I'd like to be one of them. You know, or some hint that maybe there is some sort of attraction there. You might be reading into this. If you read some of the other stories, you might say, well, you know, it's not unlike Solomon to uh, have plenty of women. So uh, maybe this is the case. We're not sure here. Again, the Ethiopians do claim on the, in their story that there was an affair between the Queen, Queen of Sheba and Solomon. I won't go into the story, but it is really interesting if you want to read uh, how they say all of this plays out. Uh, I'll just say Solomon's a pretty tricky guy, let me tell you that. If you read the story, again, there's no mention of this love affair in Scripture, uh, but it does not mean that it didn't happen. Uh, we just aren't real sure there. Solomon, again, uh, does like foreign women, and again, it probably would not be inconsistent with his character, at least, but again, it's not in the Bible. Verse uh, 9, this is what she says to him. Praise be to the Lord your God, 
Who has delighted in you and placed you on the throne of Israel? Because of the Lord's, Lord's eternal love for Israel, he has made you king to maintain justice and righteousness. Now again, she's a pagan queen. And what's she saying? She's saying, praise Yahweh. Praise the Lord for all that has happened. Now Hiram said the same thing, right? Another pagan king comes in, he sees everything, and he gives credit to God. Now again, it is interesting to think about uh, what actually happened. The theories about, uh, about uh, Solomon and uh, the Queen of Sheba having a child. There's even theories that say the Ark of the Covenant is in Ethiopia. You may have heard that one. And they, they believe that the Queen of Sheba was perhaps uh, the way it w- in which it got down there. Uh, scholars go to this region in Ethiopia now. There are, there are huge pockets of Jewish tribes in Ethiopia, very interesting, isn't it? How did they get there? And again, some take it all the way back to Solomon and believe that there is a connection there. The bottom line, though, is that Solomon has a lot of stuff. He's given wisdom by God, and, he gets, and God gets all of the credit for this. Again, the benefits of God's wisdom and justice and righteousness uh, in Solomon's life is clear, and the words of the Queen of Sheba affirm that. Verse 10 she gave the king 120 talents of gold, more gold, like he doesn't have enough, right? He gets more. 120 talents of gold, large quantities of spices and precious stones. Never again were so many spices brought in as those the queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. Again, she's bringing lots of gift, gifts to him. Verses 11 and 12, we read of other gifts that were brought to Solomon. I won't read every verse here, uh, but again, this is the region that's mentioned in the latter part of verse 9. More gold, more precious stones. This time, amalga wood is mentioned. And we're told that Solomon uses this wood to build additional support for the temple. Now, amalga wood is probably a pine sort of wood. It would have been a little bit different than cedar. We're also told that Solomon uses the amalga wood to make instruments for the Lord's temple. Some nice guitars, right, Josh? That's what, that's what they made. Um, keep reading here, verse 13. The king Solomon gave the queen of Sheba all she desired... And asked for. So he's giving her gifts besides what he had given her out of his royal bounty. Then she left and returned with her retinue to her own country. And we hear no, nothing more of her. That's the end of the story in terms of the Bible. Again, Solomon is more wealthy than the queen, but he gives her gifts and then she heads back home. No matter what happened, that's all we have in Scripture. That's all that we know. From her visit, Solomon has, has, give, has received gold and he has given away gifts. Now her confession is that Solomon is wealthy and his wealth is from God. And again, I, I think that the purpose of this story is to highlight for us the fact that Solomon's heading downhill, but it's a tragedy that he is heading downhill because everything is so good at this point in time. Keep reading here. This is, again, I told you this story was interesting, didn't I? Look, look, at, look with me at verse 14. The weight of the gold that Solomon received yearly was 666 talents, not including the revenues from merchants and traders and from all the Arabian kings and the governors of the territories. I don't know about you, but does that number catch your attention when you're reading that? Six, six, six. Yeah? The only other place that the number 666 is used in all of Scripture is in the book of Revelation, and it is the what? The mark of the beast. Exactly. Now, again, it would be speculative for me to try to give you the theory of that. I don't know. It's just there. Now, people have written, if you, again, go, go, find, um, go Google this uh, verse, and you'll find all sorts of theories out there about how this ties in. But again, the Bible, just the, the number's just there. Do you think um, that it's just by chance that the number is there? Do you think that perhaps this number is symbolic? This, this number is giving us some indication that all of Solomon's gold is really the beast or the mark of the beast, the, the devil, it's Satan, it's evil. I, I think that's probably what it's saying here. There's something uh, evil going on here. Again, Solomon is God's chosen king, but we know where the story's heading, right? If you come the next few weeks, you'll, you'll, we'll read more about that, where, that, where it's going. But it's heading downhill. He's heading away from God. Again, um, I think we have his wealth, his fame, his wisdom on the one hand, and then on the other hand, we have this accumulation of gold. 
more and more gold, more and more stuff. We read here, if you keep reading, uh, he's making shields and goblets of pure gold. He constructs this elaborate throne. Uh, We talked about that a few weeks ago, but the throne is overlaid with ivory and gold. Look with me in verse 20 of chapter 10. Nothing like it had ever been made for any other kingdom. Solomon's house, in the house, everything's made of gold. He doesn't settle for less. In fact, in verse 21 we read, Nothing was made of silver. Because silver was considered of little value in Solomon's days. And when you got that much gold, you don't do anything with silver, right? So this is what it's like in Solomon's time. In verse 22, the king had a fleet of trading ships at sea along with the ships of Hiram. Once every three years, it returned carrying gold, silver and ivory, and apes and baboons. Isn't that an interesting picture? <laughs> One translation translates the word ships that's translated in NIV as ships of Tarshish. And if you look on a map and you see, it's very likely the ship is going out on a journey that would have taken three years. And they're collecting all of the stuff and they're bringing it back. And Solomon's got monkeys running around in his house even. So it's very interesting sort of stuff going on here. The bottom line is stated in verse 23. King Solomon was greater in riches and wisdom than all the other kings of the earth. This guy is rich, and he's wise, and he's famous beyond measure. Verse 24, the whole world sought audience with Solomon to hear the wisdom that what? God had put in his heart. Again, I think this story makes his downfall even more tragic, doesn't it? Because he's given all of this. And God's the one who gave it all to him. And it makes his fall really sad, I think. He keeps getting more and more. Verse 25, year after year, everyone who came brought a gift. Articles of silver and gold, robes, weapons, and spices, and horses, and mules. I mean, what do you buy this guy for Christmas, right? I mean, he's got it all. And people show up, more gold, more silver, more stuff, and more what? Horses. Now, I think that we've talked about this before, too. You remember what the law says in Deuteronomy. It says the king must not accumulate horses. And I think the author of 1 Kings lets us know this guy's going a little too far, isn't he? He's getting more stuff, and he's getting more horses. Verse 27, the king made silver as common in Jerusalem as stones, and cedar as plentiful as sycamore fig trees in the foothills. It's a good thing for the people of God, the wealth, the security, the peace, all that's happening here. But as the chapter closes, again, verse 28, so Solomon's horses were imported from Egypt and from Q. Again, the scripture, the law specifically forbids kings importing horses from Egypt, and this is exactly what Solomon is doing. We're getting an indication this guy is heading down the wrong path. So what do we do with a chapter like this, right? I mean, you read this chapter and you're wow, it's just interesting stuff, you know? I, it, it's kind of cool. But again, this is God's Word. And God's Word is not just to read for entertainment, right? We don't read God's Word to go, oh, that was kind of interesting, that it was kind of cool. God's Word is written for the purpose of doing something in you and me. So we asked the question this morning, what is God trying to tell us through this story? Uh, again, The Bible is not a history book. Certainly it contains history, but its main purpose is not historical. The Bible is not a science book. It contains science, but its main purpose is not science. The Bible is the story of God. And what we read in the story of God tells us about our own story, right? And the Bible, as we read in Hebrews, has power to do something in us. So what's the Bible telling us here? Why is the author of 1 Kings telling us this story? And what does it have to do with your life and my life? I think this morning that this chapter is trying to communicate that Solomon was richly blessed by God. He had wisdom, he had riches, he had fame. It was unmeasurable and it was all from God. God. The Queen of Sheba shows up and she goes, this is all from God. This is, this is more than I could have ever imagined. And this morning as we read this, maybe this morning God has given you much. He's given me much. And maybe this morning, let me remind her that we need to credit God for that. It's not our own, our own deal. It's not because we've worked hard. It's not because uh, we've, we've been faithful. It's because God 
has given it to us. And this morning, we just give credit to God for our prosperity. On the other hand, I think that this story also reminds us that prosperity is dangerous, right? The more that Solomon gets, the further he veers from God. The more gold, the less faithfulness. You might remember Jesus actually said in Matthew chapter 20, and I've skipped around a little bit here, Larry, so we'll flip two slides there. Um, In Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, Jesus said, No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You you cannot serve both God and money. I, I think this is what we're reading in the story this morning. Solomon's got too much stuff, and his stuff is going to bring harm in terms of his life. Maybe this morning, God's given you resources. You know, the fact that we all live in America today, we're all rich. I mean, if you really took the whole globe and you looked at most, of, even the poorest among us would be in the 97, 98 percentile in terms of, in terms of wealth for, for the whole world. I don't think there's many of us who are sitting in here today that can't say, God's, God's blessed. God's given me stuff. He's given me material resources. This morning, we need to be aware that that's a dangerous place to be. And so maybe this morning, we would be warned. Pay attention. Listen, give God credit, live with open hands. You see, that's what we live, that's how we live in prosperity. And and if our focus is on getting more and getting more and getting more and getting more, then we're in a dangerous place, and I think we learned that. I'm going to ask you to flip the slide back, just one there, Larry. We're going to flip over to chapter 11 tomorrow. Or not tomorrow. <laughs> you guys don't have to come back tomorrow. <laughs> um, next Sunday, we're going to flip over to chapter 11. We're going to keep going with the story. And I love how chapter 11 starts, and I think this is the point here. King Solomon, however. That a beautiful picture of where the story's going. We read today about the wealth, the fame, the riches. But next week, we're going to see it's heading downhill. Solomon's going to compromise. And again, spoiler alert, by the time it's all over, the temple's going to be laid in rubble. Solomon's going to be dead, and the nation's going to fall apart. This morning, I'm not sure how God is speaking to you, what he's saying to you, how his word is working in your heart this morning, but I'm confident that it is. Maybe this morning, you would be challenged in some way. God's prompting you, he's pricking you, he's saying something to you right now, and you want to respond to that. Maybe you'd respond just by staying in your seat and and praying during this last song. Maybe this morning you'd like to come and kneel at the altar, and the altar is open as the band comes for you to come and kneel and talk to God here. Maybe this morning you'd like to pray with me, and I'll be standing out front to pray, or you'd like to make a decision in terms of joining this church and, and being a part of this community or being baptized. If that's something that you'd like to do, you come down now as we stand and sing together. Let's all stand.